Thank you very much and thank you for your invitation. It's a particular pleasure to be here in Dublin at a sunny post-referendum day. <laughs> and uh, there had been rumors that we didn't dare to come before the referendum to make these presentations, but it was just to avoid uh, to, that you get over 70% with our convincing ideas on the reform of the fisheries <laughs> policy. Um, I, I have to make a little warning uh, before starting my presentation. This is, as many people know, a subject uh, which is at the same time very political and very technical. So I'm aware that uh, w within the audience there are some fishery specialists who will <coughs> certainly be disappointed. We have another opportunity tomorrow morning, I understand. And uh, I will also try to avoid to be too technical for those of you who are not familiar with the technical aspects of the fisheries policy. We have presented uh, um, in April, we the European Commission, a green paper on this reform of the common fisheries policy. And this green paper is intended to launch a broad <coughs> consultation with our member states, with the regions in the member states, and certainly also with the stakeholders. And uh, the idea is really to get this process of reforming the fisheries policy right. <coughs> now, there are two things which I have to say, but nobody will believe me when I say it. First, the Commission does not have any prefixed ideas on what should be the proposals for the reforms, and we don't have in our offices prepared any proposals yet. It is a real consultation which is open. And the second thing is, contrary to the impression we are always giving, or apparently we are always giving, the Commission does not claim for itself a monopoly of good ideas. We want to have good ideas. The problem is so big that we need good ideas from the outside to make appropriate um, proposals which will then be the basis for negotiations in the Council of Ministers. Um, it, just a brief reminder uh, for those who ha have not yet had the screen book in their hands uh, how we structured this paper. Um, <coughs> there's an introductory page uh, at the beginning which is called Vision 2020. This is a bit out of the mod uh, in these days because uh, the uh, President Barroso has uh, made a long speech in the European Parliament before he was confirmed, which he called Vision 2020. But it is very important, and it's particularly important in fisheries policy, that we try to look ahead a bit more than six months or one year, which is, by the way, one of the problems of the current policy, so that we have an idea, or a discussion at least, what we are targeting for. And uh, if you call this sustainable fishery, uh, or uh, sustainable and uh, regional fishery, or whatever it is, but a discussion on the vision uh, more long term, if you consider that 2020 is not very long term, it's very important. Secondly, uh, we elaborate in the Green Book on what has already been achieved in the last reform. We have, in a certain way, a 10 years rhythm of reforms in the common fisheries <coughs> policy. We identify the current structural failings. We uh, identify the areas where we clearly think that improvements are needed. And what is very essential, the Green Book raises uh, hundreds of questions, and I will certainly not use the time now to rephrase these questions, but that is only to confirm what I just have said. It is an open process. We really raise these questions in a way that we uh, are reflecting on problems, and uh, not just uh, uh, for the sake of giving the impression that we are consulting somewhere. It's a real consultation, and we want to be inspired for the good uh, for what answers uh, we uh, should give uh, to solve the problems. And finally, I will come to that at the end of my presentation, what will be the next steps in this quite lengthy process. Just a short reminder on the last uh, 2002 reform, which uh, I think people still call the Fischler reform. At the time was Commission of Fischler dealing with that. We have made a lot of progress in the last reform, and it would be, in my view, a mistake to give the impression that all this was bad and that we need to do something totally different now. It's rather a process, it's a reform process. For example, we have clearly improved the involvement of stakeholders. The RAX, that is an abbreviation, uh, not everybody is, is meant to know what RAX is. These are regional advisory councils 
these are bodies where stakeholders, both of the fishing industry but also of the environmental organizations, get together. And this has enormously relaxed the uh, relations between those who are engaged in the industry or who are stakeholders and the uh, decision makers. So this is a clear progress. Another second point is that we have started with the 2002 reform and this is going on and will be continued under the new setup. Uh, building policy instruments rather in the form of long-term plans instead of what used to be the traditional fishery policy decision-making instead of having annual decisions and quotas and all the technical uh, elements of uh, fishery management uh, with a lot of instability because uh, there was a risk that every year things were changing. We have also moved from a system which was originally only based on fixing quantities, the famous totally allowable catches which were then divided through member states in form of quotas, uh, to a system uh, where uh, the fishing is managed by efforts, that means we fix a certain amount of days where fisher boats can, can go out. Uh, it's a big discussion what is be better and certainly uh, several of our questions are dealing with this um, uh, problem. Is it better to manage, have a fishing management on the basis of quantities or is it better to have a fishing management ba on the basis of time, the time a fisherman can go out to fish. Then I apologize for these uh, not consumer friendly uh, abbreviations. Um, in the framework of the 2002 reform, a community agency has been uh, created, established to improve controls in the fishery sector. So this should be the common. The, what is it? Say it again. Community Fisheries Control Agency. Community Fisheries Control Agency. Um, we have also started in the last reform, this is certainly something which we have to continue to reflect upon, um, to improve the international agreements, especially with developing countries on fisheries. I will not go into detail on this, but it's a very delicate and sensitive issue. And we have already tried in 2002 to move direct subsidies away from uh, fishing capacity, which means in simple terms uh, we don't give any money anymore for building new ship, so because the main problem is overcapacity. And finally, as a further element of the 2002 reform, uh, environmental aspects have, to, have been taken more in, into account. So this means the reform as we see it for the next reform as we see it, should be building on the achievements of the last reform, but clearly uh, on the basis of stating that what has been set up in 2002 is not enough. More needs to be done. And uh, I have the impression after a few months of consultations of stakeholders and member states that everybody agrees on this statement. Uh, there are heavy disagreements on what needs to be done and how much needs to be done. But uh, I think there's a broad uh, understanding and agreement that the current instruments are not <coughs> enough to solve the problems in the fishery sectors. So I think it is fair to say that we need a reform and we need, you could also say, a radical reform of the current setup. Why we have over-exploitation of stocks Still 86% are beyond the environmentally tenable limit of sustainability. We have insufficient supply of our own fishery products on the European market. 60% of our fish consumption is imported from third countries. We have, and that is probably the biggest problem, a clear overcapacity of fishing fleet. We have poor profitability. Uh, low prices, by the way, um, on fish products. Um, the sector is heavily, still heavily subsidized directly and indirectly. And uh, we get information from several member states that the costs of public management of the current fishery policy uh, sometimes exceeds the value of the lending of fish. So that means that the administrative costs to run this policy costs more than you get out of profit on this sector. You can, of course, immediately react to this uh, and saying this is only a proof that we are over-bureaucratic and we should leave more for the, to the market. But it is a problem. I'm not, I'm not sure if we have any other 
economic sector within the EU where you could make such a statement. And uh, it is clear that uh, everybody is also unhappy on uh, a very con complex policy setup, uh, which is complex for public administrations. It is certainly also complex for those who have to live as economic operators under the current rules. Um, there's a lot of micromanagement. Personally, I must tell you, I'm not so confident that after several years of discussions on a reform of the policy, the outcome will be less complex. Uh, and uh, we, uh, as uh, from our arrogant Brussels Commission point of view, we are always defending ourselves that the Commission makes simple proposals which then are complicated by our 27 member states. In the case of, in the case of fisheries policy, is a bit less because uh, Slovakia, Slovakia, uh, Slovakia, Hungary and Austria engage a bit less in this debate. But uh, <laughs> you can imagine that uh, the debate on this is not the best uh, perspective of simplification. Now, I would like again to uh, highlight uh, to you, I have already mentioned that uh, briefly, what we have identified in the uh, Green Book as, as the five structural shortcomings. First, feed over capacity. I mentioned that. I could give you a lot of fi figures, but uh, let me uh, keep it simple. We have a clear overcapacity of fishing fleet. Uh, we have already in the discussion on the Green Book, we are facing uh, uh, a predictable situation, I must say, that most of our <coughs> member states agree with this statement, but they start to disagree that the overcapacity is in their country. <laughs> they very much agree that the overcapacity is in other countries. So the Spanish think that the overcapacity is in France and maybe in Ireland, and the Irish uh, certainly don't think that there's a particular overcapacity <coughs> In Ireland, maybe in Scotland, the Scotland's defini Scots definitely uh, don't think that they have any overcapacity. Don't misunderstand me, I don't consider Scotland as a single member state, but uh, although they are in fisheries policies, they are sometimes behaving like that. Uh, the big question on this overcapacity problem, how can you solve that? Should you leave it to the market? You should certainly not give any subsidies to increase the fleet, that is obvious. But should we leave it to the market? One idea which is coming up very much is that if you have a system of individual fishing rights linked to boats or not linked to boats being transferable, <coughs> the economic value to feed, then you might have a reaction of the market where the adaptation of the feed will adapt automatically. It's just one idea, but we consider that the overcapacity of the fleet is by far the bigger, one of the two biggest problems, I would say. Another problem is certainly that we don't have a common agreement on what is the objective of the fisheries policy. Is that an economic policy, is it an environmental policy, or is it a social policy, or is it in some parts of the EU a regional policy? Probably it's all of that. But is there a hierarchy of objectives? Uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, the ecologically sustainability uh, should be the basis of everything. If you don't have ecologically sustainable fisheries, you can talk about economic and social problems for a long time, but uh, you will not talk about those problems in 20 years anymore because you will, ha will not have any fisheries anymore. But the fundamental disagreement within the EU on what are the objectives of the common fisheries policies and what is the ranking amongst the objectives is certainly one of our current problems. And then, uh, and that I would classify um, besides the overcapacity as this, the second biggest problem, we have a fundamental problem in the system of decision making. You, I don't think that we have any more any community policy where Ministers at their level, and it's nevertheless the highest level of decision making in the EU, love so much to take micromanagement decisions on mesh sizes for this and that, fish and all this. All practical, all decisions in the common fisheries policies are taken at the highest decision making level with 27 ministers. And that is simply bad. Why is it bad? Because you mix up politics with techniques, technical things. Secondly, it's very time-consuming and uh, 
thanks to your help uh, last week, uh, with the Lisbon Treaty it will be more time consuming because fishing policy will move to co decision with the European Parliament. And uh, it is also wrong because uh, you, you have a decision making system where nobody makes the reflection what is the best level of decision making. Should we leave the main political decisions of the Council of Ministers? Should the Council then not delegate either where things are of common interest but where they are more technical to the Commission and implementing uh, legislation or where they, things are more local to member states and even to regions within member states? So this is something which is our daily work in Brussels. It is clearly it's, it's clear that this government governance deficit uh, is something we, where we need fundamental changes. Leaving aside that, with the Lisbon Treaty set up, where the Parliament will have to co-decide with the Council, it is simply impossible to do micromanagement on that level. There is another aspect of improving decision making: how can we move more to the regional level? The problems in the Baltic Sea and the Mediterranean, and now we are also a, fishing, a small fishing power in the Black Sea and in the Atlantic, they, are all, they have similarities but they are all different. And can we find a way that uh, more input into decision making when we are dealing with the Baltic Sea is coming from the Baltic countries only and said from the whole European Union? I, <coughs> When the Council of Ministers is fixing the tax and quotas for the Baltic Sea, as you can imagine, the Greek minister and the Portuguese minister and uh, the Cyprus minister are not excessively interested in this subject, and uh, nor is Estonia or Lithuania when we discuss the Mediterranean. So should, where could we find the right balance between a reasonable regionalization of the policy, but at the same time uh, safeguarding the main basic standards because this should nevertheless remain a common policy. So these are only some aspects of, I'm, I'm nearly finished now, of uh, the big problem of improving governance or decision making, whatever you want. You could consider the next point as part of, uh, oh, you told me I shouldn't look to the slide, as, <laughs> look the audience, uh, as part of governance. How could we make the industry more responsible? Currently the situation is that we have a scarce and precious common good, which is fish stocks. We give it for free to fishermen and um, they have also a broad scope of freedom to criticize everything we are doing, but they are not taking a lot of responsibility. How can we make the industry more responsible? Indirectly, this has already started to happen uh, because the Retailers are getting more demanding on the quality of fish products uh, and so on, but how can we build into this uh, sectorial policy, which is the fisheries policy, a more industry taking more responsibility for responsible fisheries? That is another big subject where we really desperately look uh, for good ideas. And finally, uh, a very diplomatic way to formulate uh, the thing develop the culture of compliance. Well, uh, you don't have any other policy where rules are so systematically ignored uh, as in fisheries policy. It's difficult to control. If somebody is far away on the seas, it's difficult to control. Uh, we are about to make quite a progress now in, 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 in negotiating just in these days a, an improvement of our control rules but it is frustrating from our side to see how difficult it is to find an agreement uh, with member states on some basic rules of sanctions. <coughs> well, normally in other areas it's quite, if you cross the red light when you're not allowed to cross, uh, that you have to pay a fine. It's quite, quite obvious. <laughs> but, uh, suggesting to some of our member states, I'm not saying this is the case of Ireland, but to some of our member states that you should have fines uh, more than uh, 40 euros for overfishing illegally, uh, shocks them and to say we have never done that and, and we don't have uh, the means to control that. It is not only a problem and it's not only developing the culture, it's simply a scandal 
how little compliance and enforcement we have in fisheries policy, and this needs to change. And by the way, if you better control, it might enable fishermen to fish more because then uh, you count the stocks you fish and, and not like, uh, like uh, now you count only part of the stocks and then you are surprised that the stocks don't improve because the others... And we have examples, I will not give any example, uh, concrete examples where we have examples where some quotas are overfished, not 10% or 20%, but 100 or 200%. And uh, there again, member states' attitude is very much, yes, this is a problem, but it's a problem elsewhere, not with us. Okay, we, uh, we, we are used to these arguments, but uh, I'm afraid to a certain degree and to different degrees is a problem everywhere. Now, uh, to just, uh, I will not run through all these bullet points. These are just some themes, just some themes of discussions. If I could just uh, pick out of this uh, attractive list of things, each of these <coughs> points would merit half an hour of explanation. The first point, differentiated regime for small-scale coastal fleets. That will be a very big and very controversial debate. Would we be able to solve some of our economic and social problems in suggesting different rules for what we call the big industrial fisheries and what we call the small-scale coastal fleets? Looks extremely attractive. In my home country, Germany, we have a saying uh, also, uh, if I may, also small kettle makes shit, <laughs> which means uh, you... If you, if you go in this direction, you should not end up in having so many small-scale coastal fleets exempted from the normal rules that the problem of fish stock is not so evident. <coughs> Very difficult discussion. The most difficult issue in this discussion is where can you draw the borderline? Something which is small in some countries is very, very big in other countries. Should, would we not need a common borderline or could we leave this to them as a very difficult issue? Then the third point is something which fishery non-experts might uh, not understand because either something is stable or something is relative, <laughs> but relative stability is one of the big document, documents of the, of the fishery policies. And uh, I tried, I hesitate in the presence of so many experts to explain it in a simple way. When the system of quotas was set, set up, and we set up a quantities for, e for each fishery to be fished and uh, fix them every year. It, uh, a key was established between member states, which is called quota, how much they would get from the cake. And the key was in the mid-80s or early 80s, what they had fished in the previous five or ten years, I don't know that. So, so this cake was divided, has never been changed. And, uh, but reality has changed. There are member states who uh, get quotas which they never use. They use 60 or 70 percent. Uh, and there are others who uh, would like to have much more because their fleet has developed. Now, uh, the question we have raised, and you can't imagine the reactions we got, can we seriously discuss a fundamental reform of a fishery policy without asking the question, has the dividing of the cake, is the division of the cake, which has been done uh, 25, 30 years ago, afterwards a little bit sophisticated with some enlargements, uh, can, can we, uh, do we not need to discuss if this division is still appropriate or if we should find a more flexible system? We are not suggesting that we drop all this, but we are <coughs> suggesting to discuss it. That is uh, our modest, uh, <coughs> modest uh, suggestion. Then the la two last bullet points, and then I will uh, be finished. We have, of course, in fisheries policy a very important external dimension. Fish is moving around. It doesn't take uh, care of territorial or waters or economic zones. So it is very important to get into perspective also what our partners, for instance, in the Atlantic are doing, and it is important also to reflect on um, the fishery partnership agreements, which is a sort of uh, development aid scheme, which is extremely controversial and very heavily criticized by, envi by environmental NGOs. And last but not least, uh, another abbreviation, I apologize, integration into the integrated maritime policy. The policy development as a whole is going in the direction 
to see the maritime issues not in an isolated way, way, not fisheries, not transport, not environment, not energy, but rather to reflect on how can we do an integrated policy approach in the various regions. For example, the Irish Sea has, I could imagine, fisheries <coughs> problems, environmental problems. It's probably a very a place of very dense uh, traffic and, and so on. And how could we promote from the European perspective, but then leave uh, to a large extent to member states and several member states, a more integrated approach to uh, policy making uh, in which, of course, fishery would be a very important part. Just a very brief last word uh, uh, on how the process will go on. The consultation on the Green Book is uh, open to until the end of the year, and we very much hope that we also will get from Ireland a lot of contributions. Then uh, we will have to do it internally in the EU as a new instrument. An impact assessment will take us several months. Uh, we can expect concrete Commission proposals on the reform by the end of next year or beginning of uh, 2011. Please bear in mind that our Commission will also change and we have to convince our new Commission as well on all these things. And the idea is that the new reform will be adopted by the Council of Ministers by the end of 2012. This means it's quite a long process, but it is, uh, the time will pass very quickly. The more ideas we get at an early stage, the more we have a guarantee that there will be a very good outcome. Thank you very much. Thank you.